one of the questions that I started asking in, in as polite a way as possible is, why do you eat meat? And I, I'm really curious about that. I didn't mean it as a rhetorical device. I really wanted to understand. And on my book tour recently, I've just been to um, 12 cities, and people have told me all of the excuses or some of the classic excuses to why they eat meat. So I made a list of them, and I'll just read them now and come back to a few key ones. One is that, uh, and you've all heard, I'm sure all of these, animals who lead a happy life and have an easy death should be our food. That's the most common one. Two, all other animals eat meat, why not us? Three, humans have always eaten meat. Uh, it is natural. Four, God told us to. Um, glad you laugh. I, I told that to Dan Ellsberg, and he says, yeah, but God also told Bush to invade Iraq. <laughs> Whenever God tells you something, like that, get a second opinion. <laughs> I agree with that. The protein myth, the strength myth, the healthy diet myth, because it tastes good, um, because it was good enough for my parents, it's good enough for me, acculturation, socialization. Um, some people at some point in history had no choice. Um, we would, the, the animals would die out as a species unless we raise them for food. Plants, I'm glad you laughed at that one too because that, I, I heard that more often than anything else. Plants suffer, uh, otherwise I'll be a social outcast. That's true, actually, <laughs> except here. <laughs> and, um, but the actual strange, real reason that most people eat meat is not something that I heard at all, um, and that's because we can. And nobody ever says that. It's interesting. Now, I'll go back just to a few of these. Um, to talk about for a few minutes and then we'll open it up for discussion because I'm sure you have as many interesting ideas on this as I do. About the happy life and an easy death. Uh, the reason I find that so upsetting is, uh, of course it's not true, but it's also something that these people have not really thought about when they say they've had a happy life. And even the most intelligent of people can say that. Michael Pollan, for example, in The Omnivore's Dilemma, has a famous statement that sadly encouraged people who were vegetarians and vegans to go back to eating meat. He said, if you visit a wonderful organic farm like the Salatin Farm in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia, and you see happy animals, and you realize that of course they're happy, then you understand that when the animal rights people talk about these farms as a death camp, they are engaging in a sentimental conceit. Everybody thought, isn't that a brilliant, a brilliant insight? But it's not. It's not even an insight at all. It's not true. And it, it couldn't possibly be true because we're entitled to our sentiments about animals being killed. So, of course these are death camps. They're not summer camps. Their parents are not waiting. Here they come, they're getting off the bus. Wait for the animals. They're not coming back. It's an end station for them. So of course they're death camps. That's the only possible description, or death row if you like. But something to do with dying because that's what they're there for. None of those animals chose to be there. They're there at our insistence for our use. We're not doing them any good. So when they talk about, and happy life, what kind of a definition of happiness is that? The, the, their lives are terminated long before their natural term and none of these animals live the lives they intended to lead by evolution. They're supposed to be free, they're supposed to procreate, they have families, they have friendships, they have all the emotions they're capable of when they're in a natural situation. So no domestic animal ever gets that. No domesticated animal, with the possible exception of dogs and cats, and they're probably the only two animals who may have chosen us. No other animal wanted to be there, and we were talking about informed consent. Well, these animals do not have the information, and they did not consent. If they knew what was awaiting them, they would leave. And when people tell you about domesticated animals wanting to be with us, just look around and see where they're kept. They're never free. They can't go. They're in cages or corrals. And of course, that doesn't apply to here because these are rescued animals. Very different situation. But on any other farm, no matter how, quote, ideal, the purpose of the animals being there is for exploitation by humans, never for their good. 
So I've had people tell me, I'm a farmer and I love my animals. And I say, to what point? Up until the point where I slit their throat. Well, that's not how we use the word love in our language. And what bothered me about the omnivore's dilemma is that uh, it's telling people what they want to hear. And I do have, I have a problem with the notion of humane meat, of freedom meat, as they call it, in England. Um, as, and I'm sure many of you do as well. I don't think that is an oxymoron. How can an animal be raised humanely if it's only raised to be killed? So I don't think it's fair. It gives people an excuse. And I think these books are popular because people want to do what they've always done. I think there's a profound issue around acculturation of how we started eating meat. On the other hand, almost everyone in this room at some point was able to stop. And it's an interesting question how we're able to do that. Um, I think, I think it's fascinating. Unfortunately, mostly had cliches about how people did it, but interesting cliches. You know, there was a moment when they suddenly look at an animal and they realize, my God, you know, I'm looking into the eyes of a pig or a cow and I see something very similar to what I see in the eyes of other, of other animals, other human animals. You know, most of you have been able to do it in one field or another. You say, damn it, no, I'm not going to eat that piece of meat because I know there was suffering. Gene has a wonderful line in his new book where he says, the reason I don't drink milk and eat eggs is I don't want to participate in the suffering I've seen. I don't want to be part of that. And that's as simple as that. By the way, that's, you must get that all the time. People say, what on earth is wrong with milk and eggs? Where's the suffering? Where's the harm in that? And you really have to explain it. It, it doesn't come naturally. People don't look at it and say, oh my God, I see it. They don't have a visceral reaction, as, as often people do, to actual meat. I can't tell you how difficult it was for me to get in to the place where they keep chickens who lay eggs. They did not want me to see what goes on there. Even a salmon farm. I could not see a salmon farm. I called 20 of them in New Zealand and said, absolutely not. They don't want you to know that the animals are suffering because then you're going to think twice or three times before eating them. You're going to wonder about it and say, well, should I be eating this? And it's going to stay in the back of your mind. I remember 30 years ago here in California, Cesar Chavez was talking, and I proudly walked up and said, I'm a vegetarian too. He said, do you eat uh, eggs and drink milk? I said, sure. He said, well, you're causing more suffering by doing that. And I was shocked. I'd never heard this. Then people swooped in. I never got to ask him why. It took me years and years to discover. Because the reason he said that is because when he went to see the farm workers, he saw the conditions of the animals and he was able to make that connection. That was so wonderful, you know, that he could see while well, they're treating the farm workers badly and they're treating the animals badly. And it figures. Why wouldn't they? Of course. And what, do you know what the uh, rate of people leaving slaughterhouses is in the year? That's right, 100%. They don't want to work there. They're abused, the animals are abused, they're. they're it's a horrible life for everybody involved, and that's why it's so hard to see them. They don't want you to see it. So thank you for that. You're absolutely correct. My final word to you, translate, translate, translate. Whenever anybody says to you, well, you know, this animal lived for such a, a period, four or five years, and therefore that's enough, and now we can eat it, think, well, translate that into, you know, do a thought experiment. Would I be willing to give Elan to somebody who's going to have the best education in the world and the best life for the first six years and then off to the slaughterhouse? I mean, we really need to do this all the time. Think about our dogs, our cats, our friends, our people, our children. Is this, and it's just, Mark's right, it's common sense. Do we want these things to happen? Of course we don't. So why are they okay for other animals? They're not. And I'm glad that you realize that too. Thank you so much.